Hello class, this is Professor Allen, and here is Lecture Day 23 of Early Western Civilization, picking up right where we left off on Tuesday's lecture in class. And we are starting, or resuming, where we were with the Carolingian Dynasty and the Carolingian Renaissance. And so, this Carolingian Renaissance, we've already mentioned about vellum and the, uh, basically, which was animal skin, which was cleaned, um, after being skinning, skinned from the animal, obviously, it was cleaned and then stretched on wooden racks left to dry, um, to somewhat become kind of paperish, um, kind of more like leather almost, um, a leathery style paper, which of course is pictured here or here or here. And, um, the amount of documents that are made still in vel or made back then of vellum that last till today is quite impressive. It's well over 8,000, um, documents from that period of history that last to today um, because it you know it dries out but it doesn't get too too much worse um, than it already is unlike papyrus and other things that sometimes decay and stuff but this you know it, it's more hardy than papyrus and other paper um, and that's why it kind of lasts in fact, thanks to the Carolingians, 90% of all knowledge that we have of the Roman um, Empire and the Roman Republic and anything documented during those years is actually preserved in Carolingian documents, about 8,000 of them today. And um, thanks to that, we actually have such a good knowledge of the Roman period because the Carolingians decided, okay, well, let's write down everything we have from all these papyrus and other scrolls that we have that we've been finding in Italy as well as other places. And so it's actually a huge amount of knowledge that's been preserved thanks to this dynasty, this uh, renaissance back then, this mini renaissance. If it hadn't been for this mini renaissance, we probably would know very little other than through archaeological means. And a few, you know, stone tablets or something like that might exist. But uh, for the most part, it's thanks to the Carolingians that we have it. Um, also, during the Carolingian Renaissance, we end up actually having a new style of handwriting developed called Carolingian Minuscule, okay? And um, it's actually used from Charlemagne's time onwards um, throughout the entire medieval period, um, uh, even into the Renaissance period, kind of, it's used, and in some ways afterwards, but not as much. Um, but in some places in Europe it is. Um, it actually used both uppercase and lowercase letters, um, which is why I kind of said that um, the joke about the Renaissance being not a real Renaissance because it's only a really rediscovery of information as opposed to new ideas um, with the Carolingians. Um, Renaissance last time, I made that joke that I, it's a lowercase r as opposed to an uppercase r because it's not a big renaissance. Well, it's kind of also a joke because um, Carolingian minuscule is the first time that really ever introduced uppercase and lowercase letters, so I was making a kind of history joke there. Um, but um, it's actually interesting because lowercase letters was what was used for generations and generations and what thousands of years beforehand they only really had one type of um, scale, uh, size or type of letter it was all what is known as lowercase ones today right um, the, w which would look like those um, eventually the uppercase ones gets introduced during this Carolingian Renaissance really to start sentences and proper names and things like that but that was started during this period of time around the 800s or 760s give or take 790s to 7.6, uh, uh, 800s, um, as well as a little bit earlier. And so um, it also had a larger letter always at the beginning of a page or a paragraph, which you may have seen in pictures of documents um, or just uh, movies and things like that, which has the big letter S or the big letter C or A or whatever letter of the first word is, um, is always much bigger and usually drawn with a lot more style. And it looks really cool, right? You know, if Got, you've got this word here, which has an S as the beginning, so that's why the S is here, um, and it's so much bigger than all the rest of the type, um, or not really type, it's handwritten, right? Um, and so that kind of started during this period of time as well, and you'll see it in a few more pictures in this class as well as um, uh, in other other lectures as well for this course. Um, moving, on, um, uh, moving on, let's go on to... Um, one last thing about the Carolingian dynasty and Renaissance, um, uh, Charlemagne ruled with a bureaucracy, 
okay, and had a lot of counts and administrators kind of doing the job for him to rule his entire empire, because his empire by the time of his death in 814 was very large. It was all of this blue area, even the lighter blue areas, um, and down here as well into Italy. Um, of course, yellow is the papal states, right? Um, and so uh, to govern all of this amount of area, he would need a lot of counts and administrators, counts being like the dukes or barons of the areas, the rulers, the minor nobility of certain areas or provinces kind of like governors almost. Um, he also adopted a standard coinage across the um, his empire. Beforehand we have already had like the Roman coinage was relatively standardized where it would be certain coins would be worth certain amounts based on what they were you know printed kind of like quarters and dimes and nickels are today. They're, a, they're always that amount. Um, that's what it was during the Romans with their Sesterces and Denari. Um, but the, it, in the period after the Roman Empire, no one really kind of follow, kept following that, um, but uh, the Carolingians under Charlemagne, as well as his son, etc., kind of continue it with um, the silver pound being the main coin, and it was equal, and it was originally weighed a pound, um, and it was worth twenty shillings, twenty smaller silver coins called shillings. Sometimes they were copper or another material metal, but um, twenty shillings were equal to one pound. Um, and that's kind of lasted in Britain and other places today. Um, but yeah, money and divisions of different values of coins was a, um, done by him. Also, lastly, before I move out of the Renaissance of the Carolingians, um, I would like to state that while we talked about him trying to get a lot of people, people educated by opening schools and things for even the poor children um, in monasteries and stuff, as well as just trying to educate others in the empire, only 1% of the francs was actually literate um, by the time you know, Charlemagne died, and it kind of continued at, at that same amount of percentage in the years afterwards. Only 1% of the people, so meaning 1 in 100 people were actually literate, and literate could have been, you know, varying in that number as well. Like, how, how literate were they? Were they, you know, barely able to read and write, or were they really exceptional? You know, that varied as well. Um, but 1%. Um, meanwhile, if we actually shift our focus at the same t time of period um, so over to the Eastern Romans with the Byzantines and Constantinople, or even to the Arab world, so North Africa all the way into the Middle East area with the um, Arab caliphates, about 10 to 15 percent of the people were actually literate in those areas. Um, so Charlemagne did his best to try to educate people um, under him. But, and under his rule, but in some cases it was just very difficult to have that accomplished. By the time of um, Charlemagne's death in 18, 814, um, he had actually created the largest ever Ro um, empire since the Romans. Again, this is very impressive large area, okay? Um, compared to anyone else before since the Romans, it's the largest empire, at least in Europe. Um, he is known as the father of Europe because really for the most part, that part of Europe does undergo some changes, but a lot of those areas that he conquered and controlled kind of stay at least for a while intact, even if in slight divisions, okay? Um, he gets a kind of reputation as the father of Europe, um, with some civil wars and stuff in there as well, but um, under after him. But um, yeah, there is, you know, for the most part, some of those areas stay kind of under one ruler or only a few rulers, and don't split off into tiny little groups again. Um, he, uh, the Carolingians, meaning his family, okay, are known as the family that forged Europe, okay? The family that forged Europe. And it's because he united most of Western Europe for the first time ever since the West, um, Roman Empire fell in the West, and it included parts that had actually not been under Frankish or Roman rule. Um, in fact, this area had never been under Roman rule, right? Um, in parts of Germany, it had never been. Um, and so it's kind of interesting that, like, he's actually conquered places Places that even the German, uh, the Romans didn't um, control, um, so such as parts of Germany, etc. And so, quite remarkable on that in, in in its own way. And so, let's move to what ends up happening after his death. Well, his son takes over. Um, he had several sons, I believe, um, but by the time. Um, he died, Charlemagne died in 814, there was only one son left 
alive still. Several of them had died younger. Um, and so Louis the Pious is this one son, and he becomes the new king of the Francs in 814, and he will rule until 840. Okay? Um, he is known as the Pious because he is extremely, extremely Christian. A very, very devout Christian. Um, pushed pushed the Christian church heavily at this time to his um, to the empire, as well as just anyone else that would really listen to him talking about it during the days. Um, <laughs> it was kind of interesting. Um, and he continued this cultural renaissance started by his father, because again, just like his father, he kind of believed that if you were to become educated, then you were... That was the real way to achieve salvation in the Christian faith, was to become educated and enlightened by, you know, um, under, under God and stuff. And so, um, he was very much in fi favor of continuing the cultural renaissance started by his father. And this is a picture of all, of him. And of course, um, as we've had before in several Christian, uh, f uh, pictures of the period and before all the way dating back to Constantinople, um, or Constantine, sorry, um, who built Constantinople, we have these little glowy orbs, um, around a person's head if they're a Christian. And so, um, Louis the Pious, known for his pious and devout Christianness, um, actually is pictured in almost every single picture of him with this you know, glowy orb around his head. Um, kind of interesting. Um, he inherited a very large empire, okay? Obviously, his father left him all of this, right? Minus the yellow. Um, all of this blue area. And so, obviously, yes, it's a huge empire, but it's going to be intact by basically all sorts of different sides. We're going to have the Vikings, which I'll talk about for the majority of this lecture video, um, uh, attacking from the north, okay, attacking along the coast. Um, we're going to have the Slavs attacking from beyond Saxony, these areas, okay, along this area. We're going to have the Magyars also attacking this area, as well as all the way up into the middle of the empire at different times later on. Um, and then the Saracens attacking from the Mediterranean. Um, the Saracens, of course, were basically the Arab caliphates um, attacking from either in Spain or from the coast. Um, and even a coast of Italy as well. And so, um, we've got these different, four different main groups attacking, um, the, sh uh, Louis the Pious's kingdom. Um, in, when Louis the Fi Pious died in 840 CE, um, he actually ended up, um, having three sons that were adults at the time. Um, and so, Back then, Frankish law was to actually not give it to the oldest son. They did not have a rule saying the oldest son got it. Um, and so when he died, he never really stated which one should get it. Um, and so it basically was given to all three of them. And so what ends up happening is we end up actually having, um, in 840, the country being split, um, the Francs being split, this empire of former Charlemagne and now former Char Louis the pious, splitting it into these four, three different groups, here, um, here, and here, and the three sons immediately start fighting each other, almost within a year, or even that same year of them um, getting it. Um, civil wars and the empire splits. The first one, Lothair, or Lothar, depending on the uh, spelling and the uh, source telling us of his name, um, decides to take this area, the Rhineland, to Rome, and actually conquers um, or controls all of this area, um, and defends it very well against his two brothers on the borders. You know, he's kind of sandwiched between, so that, like, basically he has to fight both this brother and this brother. This brother would never really have to ever fight this one, right, is the idea. Um, but um, Lothar is able to actually hold on to the center area from basically the Rhineland, which is the area around the River Rhine um, here in Germany, all the way down to Rome pretty well until he dies in 856. Um, you know, for 16 years he ruled that area. And after that, the other two sons that are still alive basically keep on fighting over it, and then their grandsons, etc. Um, and us until eventually in eight. Um, well, during this period of time, the two of them basically decide we're not going to fight each other um, in 843. Um, they, they didn't want to fight via long distance, right? It was the real thing. They just really wanted to gang up on the brother in the middle. And so they ended up actually causing a treaty called the Treaty of Verdun, where Louis the German of the East Franks, um, out 
here, sorry, East Franks, um, Louis the German, um, will rule there until 9-11, and then Charles the Bald um, will be in charge of the West Franks here, West Francia, um, until 987. And so the two of them end up going, you know, for a while. They're sons as well, not just the two sons, but also later on. Um, uh, their descendants, which are Louis the German, Charles the Bald. And so, yeah, I mean, we end up having the three sons fight, and then their descendants keep fighting, but for a little while they decided let's have a treaty and make it peaceful, but that doesn't necessarily last, as you can see. Um, invasions by others, you know, all the, all these four, okay, from all over, um, continue, um, throughout the next few years, and overall just weaken the Francs' authority over the Empire. Um, the Francs just become weaker and weaker and weaker over time, and local chiefs in the little areas, like the little tribal chiefs, kind of start deciding to take over on their own again. Um, the Empire splits into smaller areas um, controlled by feudal lords. These chiefs eventually start saying, okay, well, I'm the lord of this area. I'm no longer just a tribal chief. I'm, you know, more, you know, I've now got a castle or whatever. And they start actually building up small little feudal states or small little provinces and fiefs in the area. And we'll talk about that as we get to feudalism at the end of this lecture today. But first we've got the Magyars. We mentioned them during... Um, uh, Louis the Pious, but now who are they? Well, they're originally from the steppes of Asia, okay, and a nomadic group of people. Really, they're the Huns part, what, three or four at this point, like Huns being the first, and then the Avars were the next group, um, and now it's really the Magyars and the next group. It's like a bad sequel happening again to the people of Europe. And where did they come from? Well, Asia at first, um, and then... Um, got closer into, you know, Eastern Europe and started attacking. So, you know, here, and then attacked. But they were probably from the Ural Mountains um, in Asia originally. Um, and they were genetically related to both the Huns and the Avars, okay? So there must have been some intermingling there at some point on a large scale. Um, again, from the Ural Mountain area of Asia. And around the 800s CE, so roughly around the same time that Charlemagne was dying or getting very old, um, they started actually deciding to unite the Magyars, okay? Around the same time Charlemagne was still ending his reign and ruling here, okay? We end up having the Magyars um, forming up and being as opposed to a bunch of tribes, or seven main tribes, deciding to unite. And they actually unite about half a million Magyars end up uniting um, uh, with their tribal leaders being the ones in charge of this uniting, under one man named Arpad, okay, Arpad. And Arpad and the other six tribal leaders got together and actually made a blood oath, where they each cut their hand, or cut part of themselves, and bled into a chalice with some alcohol, or possibly wine, or whatever like that, or just maybe some water, and they basically drank the from this chalice with the blood and the alcohol or whatever, or water, um, and they all basically drank it together. Um, very similar to how um, Hannibal and his brother and his father um, during the First Punic War, right, or after the First Punic War did. Um, but this is the Magyard leaders doing this, and they're basically swearing that they're all going to work together as one big Magyar alliance and group, as opposed to multiple tribes that would fight each other. They're not going to do that anymore. They're going to fight everyone else instead. And in 896 CE, they end up actually um, settling roughly in present-day Hungary, roughly this area in Europe, um, but they came from this area at one point into that area. Um, but yeah, Eastern Europe. They would end up actually going on raids, as you can see in this ar uh, uh, these arrows, um, which don't even show the most of it, um, on raids in all parts of Europe. And so let's get to some of those raids. As you can see, they kind of settled in this area, and then a little bit further down here. Um, and then even all the way down to here is where they end up actually finally settling um, in Hungary, present-day Hungary today. Um, and they end up invading from here elsewhere. Um, as you can see, they can start hitting from this little area right here through 
in between all these mountains, down into the Byzantines, into the Papal States, into the Francs, any of the three of them, or the two of them at that point. There was only two sets of them. Um, and so, yeah, they can attack anywhere. And they do hit northern Italy, and they used guerrilla warfare, meaning that they would attack somewhere and then run off. Um, very much like the Huns did, very much like the Avars did against the Byzantines for decades. Um, and it's just now this group of guys doing it. Um, the Lombards, actually, which, yes, Charlemagne defeated them, but there's a few of them still around, a few small tribes throughout the north, um, through the Alps, um, and Pyrenee Mount, uh, Alps Mountains, sorry, um, actually decided to fight back against the Magyars. Some of them had kind of been hiding for a while or just under the rule of Charlemagne and then Louis the Pious and others of the Char um, Carolingians afterwards. Um, and they've kind of decided, okay, well, with the all fighting between the Franks, we can come out and start fighting on our own again against anyone invading us. And so the Lombards actually are kind of maybe a good guy this time um, <laughs> against the Magyars for Europe. Um, in 933, um, they start attacking the Francs heavily um, until one of the Carolingian kings, one of the Frankish kings named Henry the Fowler, decides to fight them at the Battle of Riad. The Battle of Riad. And this is a minor victory of the Franks or the Francs over the Magyars, okay? Um, where Henry the Fowler actually does win a big, relatively big battle, but it's kind of considered very small because, yay, we beat the Magyars, but there's still tons and tons of them everywhere else hitting Europe. Um, and so, for a little while, after that one Battle of Riyadh, the Magyars kind of go, oh, maybe we should not mess with the Francs anymore. And so they kind of retreat for a little while. Um, Henry the Fowler gets his nickname because of what? Well, Fowling was the name given to people that liked hunting with birds, okay, and working with birds, like hawks and falcons and stuff. That is fowling. Um, so he was a big fan of that. Um, hence the fowler. Um, usually, as you can see, these Frankish kings end up getting nicknames based on different things, like Louis the German. Well, he's from the German area, right, or in charge of the German area. Charles the Bald, I'm guessing you can guess where he is, uh, why he gets that name, right? because of receding hairline, or no hair, right? Moving on from Henry the Fowler, um, the Magyars kind of do retreat for a while, but eventually they will come back. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, during this time also, though, um, in East Francia, or East Francia, um, on the German side, okay, the German area, um, we have a man come to the throne named Otto I, pictured here. Um, Otto I rules from 936 to 973, and he is crowned at the city of Aachen in Germany, which was, remember, um, I said it was a capital, but not really the capital of the Franks kingdom under Charlemagne. He liked to hang out there because he built a palace there and he built a, you know, monastery and a bunch of schools there. Um, but he kept on saying, oh, it's not technically the capital. Another one is. Another city is. But he spent most of his time in Aachen. But Otto actually comes to power and it's now actually the capital of the East Franks. Um, he starts something called the Ottonian system of government named after himself, right, where he, as um, as well as some of his other higher-up advisors, end up putting monks and other church officials into government positions, um, all the way up low from, like, small little advising um, and, like, basically mayors or in charge of small little towns and villages, all the way up to the bigger positions in government. Um, and he felt that if, they, if he did that, he'd have their loyalty because they're not going to go against him if he stays Christian, right, um, as well as just being able to make sure that they're not lying because there's oaths of, you know, don't lie and stuff like that and rules about poverty and things like that that he's hoping that they'll listen to. And in some cases, they do um, end up sticking very loyal to him. Um, but one thing he does request of all the monks and church officials that he puts into these positions is that they remain celibate because he does not want these monks or church officials having wives or even just, you know, um, concubines or affairs or whatever, and leading to children being born where this job would end up becoming hereditary because guaranteed these people, if they had children, they would end up going, well, I want to groom my son as the next person to be in this same kind of administrative or mayoral or other government position duty. And so he didn't want that. He wanted to be able to pick 
who was in what position. Even if they were all church leaders or church officials, he wanted to be the ones to do one to do it, um, as well as make sure that, you know, the guy that comes after him also is in charge of doing that. So he made sure to make sure that they were celibate so they would not have children and want to push their own, like, family into a position. Um, well, in 955, um, Otto I realizes that it's time to deal with the Magyars because they've come back. Um, yes, Henry the Fowler defeated them for a while, but that only lasted for a few years. In 955, the Magyars have been coming out of this darkish red area, or lightish red area, and started doing, like, this world tour or European tour of sacking all the cities and towns that they can get to. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of little fire flame marks on this map, and even down to southern in northern Italy, where they go all through France and Germany area, and then root back round back to where they came from. And they're just doing this wor uh, tour of Europe, s destroying everything in their path, the Magyars. And so Otto I decides, okay, time to get my army together and stop them where they're going to be next. Next. And so we end up having the Battle of Lechfeld, okay? Battle of Lechfeld is fought in 955 CE, uh, so about a thousand years ago. <laughs> um, uh, or thousand and what, 30 or so years ago now, or 25 years ago. Um, and it's Magyars of the Magyar you know, tribes, okay, formerly under Arpad, but he's long gone now. Um, uh, but it's, you know, Arpad's descendants or whatever against Otto I of the of the East Franks. And Otto's army defeats the Magyars at the Battle of Lechfeld, and there's even a good cool picture of the Battle of Lechfeld where everyone's fighting on horseback um, with a bunch of dead people in the art. And what do we have writing-wise? It's Carolingian minuscule with the big S, actually, again. Um, just by coincidence that it's an S, you know? It's like, so such and such, such and such, such and such happened at the Battle of Lechfeld, is what it says. Okay? Um... And so the Magyars end up actually getting defeated, and they end up actually running back to this area here, where it is actually flat between all the mountains of Eastern Europe, um, in this area, which is known as the Hungarian Plain, or also known as the Carpathian Basin, because it's nestled right up against the Carpathian Mountains, okay, um, in present-day Hungary, okay, um, present-day country of Hungary. Um, and eventually the Magyars, over time, while they're settled there, actually um, start talking to church missions, and church missionaries start walking on out there and convert, trying to convert the Magyars, and the Magyars peacefully do convert to Christianity, and so are never really ever regarded as a threat again, um, and it's... Otto I is recognized as the person that ended the threat because of this battle, but really it was just... Yes, they've been defeated, and they're like, okay, well, I guess we're tired. We can, you know, just live here now. Um, and so, thanks to um, Christianity and thanks to Otto is, and them just deciding, okay, well, we've had our fun fighting for decades and decades. You know, maybe we can settle down somewhere peacefully. And that's what ends up happening. The Magyars settle peacefully in this area today, um, north of Bulgaria and near Croatia area. So, this area here. Um and so, yeah, there's Bulgaria and everything, which we'll talk about some of these places on the last day or so of class. And, of course, where do we have here? The Byzantine Empire, which Constantinople um, is kind of hanging on with a little bit more territory at this period of time. But, you know, that will fluctuate from year to year, like we've talked about in the past. We'll come back to them, you know, as well soon enough. Just not today. Um, Otto I ends up continuing his rule. And in 962 CE, Otto I defeats the Lombards in northern Italy when they try to attack the Papal States. Yeah, Charlemagne had defeated them once, um, and the Pope was very happy f uh, for that. Um, but now they're coming back. Like I said, they even defeated the Magyars for a little while, the Lombards. But now the Lombards are causing issues against the Papal States and the Pope. And so the Pope says, please come help me to Otto. And Otto says, I'll be there. And he rides on down with an army, defeats the Lombards. Um, and we end up having Pope John the Twelfth um, being very, very thankful and takes this crown um, and actually crowns Otto as the first ever Holy Roman Emperor, okay? Now, Charlemagne was Emperor of the Romans, even though he wasn't really in charge of the Romans at all, right? Nor was he Roman. And while Otto I isn't Roman um, and not in charge of 
the Roman Empire, um, he is, does become in charge of what is known as the Holy Roman Empire, which is kind of a misnamed thing, um, because it's at most of the time not very holy, and we'll get to that um, in the, some of this course, as well as really Western Civ 2, which I teach in the spring. Um, we'll talk about it a lot. Um, and it's definitely not Roman. It's really German and Central European, and here's a good map of it, where he actually is in charge of it in 962. It's like, yeah, there's a little bit of Europe, I mean, uh, Italy, um, which is technically Rome, is down here. Um, but it's not really based in Rome. It's really Germany, right? Um, and they're not really Roman, they're Germans, or Franks. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of a misnamed empire, but um, they try to use the Roman title and the Holy Roman idea of it as being kind of this extra credence and, you know, precedent of power and strength. Um, but mostly it is, again, in uh, Central Europe, Germany as its main core, and then we've also got Poland, which, you know, out here, but eventually it does expand um, out to there. Austria, which is this area here. Um, and then it's also Netherlands, Belgium, and parts of Italy, as you can see, parts of Italy, Belgium area, the Netherlands up here as well. And so it's really this area for the most part, but over the next about 900 years, when it finally falls under, when Napoleon actually conquers it, which again will be discussed in Western Civil II if you take the course in the spring, um, you know, it, it changes and shrinks a lot. And it also grows a bit from time to time. Um, but really, it's just not very holy um, at all. Um, and then it's definitely not Roman, right? Um, so it's really misnamed. Let's move on to the main other subject of today's lecture, and that's the Vikings. Where are the Vikings from? Well, here. Okay, and we'll get to that in a minute. But who are they, and what's the origins of the Viking name? Because a lot of people believe, like, the Vikings are, you know, this group of people that called themselves the Vikings. That's not really true. Well... The Vikings' origins come from the fjords of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, which is known as Scandinavia geographically today, okay? Which Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, okay? And then I guess a little bit of Finland, but really not so much that. Um, mostly just these two and here is where they originally come from. And those areas are very mountainous, okay? Especially, well, Denmark not so much, but definitely Norway and Sweden. And in, Den in Norway and Sweden, you have a lot of fjords, which are geographical or geological features that look like this, where they are narrow inlets of water from the coast that have very steep sides, like mountains, basically, almost immediately, um, uh, that have been created by a glacier that has thawed out and carved this out and then basically, dry, you know, thawed out and turned into water, and so that is why you end up having these inlets of water in the mountains, which are actually at sea level, okay? Um, and so big giant glaciers have melted over years and years and years, um, and made these beautiful areas. Now, yes, it's relatively cold up there, um, and not a lot of farmland, right? Um, we have another word that also helps lead to the word Viking, called Vic. Okay, that is the word for an or Icelandic word for bay or creek, and it's also really Scandinavian before that. Um, but who are the Vikings? Well, they're really actually the people called the Norse. We now call them the Vikings, but the Vikings are really just a small select few of them, and we'll get to that in a minute. But really, as a people as a whole, the people that live in that area are the Norse, okay? And they're from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, which is collectively just known as Scandinavia. So again, here, here, and here. And these are the areas you can kind of see little ledges and stuff on the map here, but this is heavily mountain, heavy mountains along here, and that's where all the, the along the coast is where these um, fjords are, okay? Well, moving on. Someone back then that went plundering, that went on raids, okay, um, be was called Vikinger, okay, because if you were to go plundering, okay, which was the word for going plundering back then, instead of saying plundering, in the Norse language, it was I Viking, okay, or I Viking, it was the way to say it, and if you did that, you were called a Vikinger, or Vikinger, 
And so that was some name given to someone that went eye viking or went plundering or raiding, okay, and attacking other people. From where? Well, these areas. The Vic or Vikin was also the area around Oslo Fjord, which the city of Oslo here um, is a really giant city in Norway, or relatively large city in Norway, small by most American city standards, but still pretty big f for back then, um, uh, was pretty important. And that little area around it was the Vicar Viken, around Oslo Fjord. And Oslo eventually was a small town under the Vikings, and then got bigger and bigger. And a lot of Vikings, or people that went Vikinger, right, that went or went I Viking, right, or the Vikinger is their name given to them, started living here and went plundering along all these different lines, okay? Now, did they look like this, with the big winged helmets or the horns on the sides of their helmets? No, not at all. Um, they would have looked similar in dress with some of the clothes, okay, with the cape and the chain mail and a shield and a sword and a spear and maybe an axe as well. And yes, a helmet, but it definitely didn't have wings or nor horns on the helmets. That's kind of been in pop culture since, okay? Now, again, this area is called Scandinavia, and there weren't really any big nation of the Norse. The Norse never had, like, one nation, okay? Um, never really even a nation amongst them at all. It was just small little settlements and towns where the people would go, hey, let's go raid somewhere. And they first started raiding each other, and then started realizing, let's stop doing that, because we don't really have much other than what we've already got in our town. Let's go raid somewhere else in Europe that has maybe a lot more cooler stuff. And so they would start making raids to Scotland or England or France or Germany, etc., uh, as well as elsewhere, as we'll get to that in a bit, over time. And anyone that was doing these raids, again, were called the Vikinger, while the people themselves, as a whole, were the Norse. However, yes, Everyone keeps on thinking, oh, everyone's doing that from these areas. No, it's actually a very few of them are the ones actually going eye-viking or going plundering and raiding. The most of the people that are living in these areas are actually traders and farmers. They trade with each other, they farm um, whatever land they can in, you know, up the sides of these mountains as much as possible. Um, and then they started realizing, okay, well, let's start migrating and going elsewhere. And sometimes they would go on the Viking trips on these raiding parties, and then they'd kind of get somewhere and be like, okay, bye guys, I'm going to start settling here. Or some of the people even going on the raiding trips would just decide to settle in a place. Now, did they only attack the coast? No, they actually could go up and down the rivers. And so in, the seven, in around 793 CE, they begin raiding the coasts. And then they start going further and further up and down rivers. Um... The Viking Age from 790, lasts from 793 to 1093, so it's a long period of time, about 300 years of period of time of this constant raiding from these three areas everywhere else, through northern and, well, also other parts of Europe as well. We'll get to that in a bit. Now, what do they use for their ships? Well, they use these. This is archaeological evidence of their ships today being dug up, and this is what they would have looked like um, in real life um, back then, and this is how they were built. They were built very small, not very big. You can see people in these pictures, um, or artistic picture there, and people on here with animals in the middle. Um, they're very small boats. Um, they were you, they were powered by not only a square sail that would go all the way down here, but also oars. People would use oars like big giant canoes, um, about 20 to 30 people on these boats, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less, depending on the size of the boat itself. Um, and so these long ships were relatively good um, because, as you can see, they relatively have a flat bottom, okay? They don't really have a very big bottom, as you can see. Um, and so they actually liked to do something called portage, the Vikings, where they would carry them over land. Now, would they carry them literally like this on their shoulders? No. Um, they would, that would be way too heavy. But what they could do is use a system of logs being placed as basically big giant rollers and move the logs at the back to the front, like so, and put it at the front and then push it along those, and then once it gets to the edge where you need more logs from the back, put them at the front, and you're basically rolling them across the land. 
What this required was the ship had to be lightweight and have a flat keel, meaning the bottom area, okay, a flat bottom, as otherwise, what would happen if it was really high up? Um, it would, what, tip over, right? But it, you know, it's relatively flat, um, so that would work out really well. Um, and you could basically portage it over land, and that would work out really well, because they'd end up going down the length of this river, and then they'd be like, oh, well, let's attack along here, and then they'd see, like, oh, well, there's another river here with juicier targets, let's jump onto that river, but it's a mile or two away, so let's put the boat on these rollers, on logs, we would just cut down trees, and move it along those. Um, so it was a pretty, pretty interesting way to get around really quick, and attack throughout even Central Europe along the rivers. Now let's talk a little bit about the North culture and their religion. Now you've probably heard of the pa their pagan gods, or at least a few of them, such as Thor, Loki, and Odin, which are in the Marvel movies, right, when they're kind of facsimiles of what they would have been in Norse mythology, with some big changes, obviously. Um, but we don't really have time for that. But here we've got Odin, the king of the gods. Um, he had one eye, he actually had the other eye was plucked out, um, and he actually had a raven flying around, basically watching and spying on everything for him. We had his son, or sons, Thor and Loki. Loki was the god of mischief, Thor was the god of thunder and lightning, and also warriors. And Thor is typically pictured as being carried on a chariot, or standing on the back of a chariot, pulled by two goats. These two goats. And his chariot could fly through the air. Um, interestingly, goats started being used in pagan festivals during this period of time, and actually later on became a symbol for Yule, or during the Christmas season, in Scandinavia. So... These areas, right? Um, interestingly, also, um, this flying idea of a flying chariot um, around the time of Christmas, or Yule, as they called it up in Scandinavia, um, kind of also eventually leads to some of the ideas of Saint Nick, with the idea of the reindeer pulling his sleigh um, in the air, but um, it's kind of a cross between a bunch of stories on that. But um, Yule goats are a typical thing that you might see or see like a statue of a goat or an ornament of a goat on a Christmas tree, and that's all hearkening back to goats being very used in pagan festivals um, and during the Vikings and, Scan and the other Norse in Scandinavia for a very long time, as well as throughout Northern Europe afterwards in Germany, etc. Um, we also have the Valkyries, which weren't exactly the gods, they were kind of like um, warrior angels um, that would kind of come down to after where a battle had been fought and kind of claim the, vic the death the dead Norse members and bring them up to Valhalla, which was translate literally to Hall of the Fallen, where it was basically the great hall or great um, building where in the sky where, or the great land in the sky, basically their version of warrior heaven. Um, conversely, um, if you went to the bad uh, version of their, their death, you know, of their, um, Afterlife. It was named Hell, with one L, not two. And it was also, Hell was the name, not only the name of their underworld, um, but also the name of the deity that was actually in charge of the underworld, and it was a woman deity um, named Hell um, that was in charge of the underworld. And then they had the Ragnarok, which was this kind of Norse version of the apocalypse. Um, and the O here should actually look, have two little dots over it. The program didn't want to use it today. Um, but yeah, so Ragnarok is their version of the apocalypse. Um, the Norse typically also made sacrifices of the gods, usually of animal sacrifices. Um, the days of the week... Um, today are actually very similar to the um, Viking ones and actually are kind of taken from the Viking ones in many ways. Sondag was Sunday, Mandag was Monday, Torsdag, Thursday, also known as Thor's Day, um, Thursday, Thor's Day, or Tor's Day, um, and then Freedag was Friday. Um, not, uh, which was Freya. Um, and so you've got these ones very similar to the days of the week today. Um, and it actually, the versions of the days of the week actually did come from, um, some of the Norse, as well as Sun's Day, like we said during Constantine, correct? Over time, some of the words have been kind of merged together. Um, 
Culture, other influences by the Norse on our culture today. You've possibly read this in high school, um, possibly even in a college English class, but Beowulf is one of those typical ones uh, um, written in Old English in the 9th century or 800s, written in Old English. Um, pictured here, again, Carolingian minuscule, but a different letter here, as not an S. Um, and so it's an epic poem, okay, or this epic story about the warrior named Beowulf, who actually is from elsewhere, but comes to Denmark to help the Danes because he hears about this monster terrorizing the people um, of the Danes, and he's like, oh, well, I need to help them, and he gets there, and it's a monster named Grendel, okay, this big varying monster depending on the version um but yes it's this grotesque monster that he has to fight and he's able to defeat it and then the continue story that he becomes king of the danes because he defeated them defeated the enemy a monster grendel he ends up having to defeat grendel's mother he ends up ended up having to fight a dragon in the last part of the book as well or the poem um and so it's this kind of oral tale originally. It was originally an oral tale or may have been written from an oral tale probably beforehand. And then, um, but it was always told orally or usually told orally. And it sometimes was possibly told orally with musical accompaniment, meaning that some would be, would be telling the story and reading it aloud to the people in the audience. And some, like they would have like a band or at least one or two music musicians with them. Um, Especially for, like, the more tense scenes of the fight would have, like, more tense music and then happier music when he's won the fight and stuff like that. Um, and this would be the kind of hall that the, um, the Vikings, uh, not just lived in, but their main big common room of, like, their throne rooms and stuff for their leaders, okay? Um, as well as where they would have communal dinners and meals and things like that. And then they would sit around telling stories, as you could see there. Moving on. Now, yes, the Vikings are known as relatively fierce warriors, but were they really the fiercest warriors ever to hit Europe? Um, and that's what a lot of the monks say, because a lot of reports of getting attacked in various places that we've shown on these maps, okay, actually come from the monks that survived or were left behind. Um, most of the men that fought against the Vikings were killed, okay, or taken as slaves or kidnapped, as well as women in some cases, um, and monks were even kidnapped by them and taken as slaves or whatever. Um, but not always. And, but even so, anyone that fought the Vikings usually ended up dying or barely living to, you know, tell the tale because the Vikings would attack somewhere and then run off. And it would be kind of like, oh, well, we got attacked by the Vikings, but we weren't really able to do anything against them before they were had destroyed a bunch of stuff and run off. You know, we never actually got to fight them. Um, and so the stories would vary. Um, but reports that came from monks and other church leaders kept on saying that they were the most horrible people ever and the worst and fight uh, strongest and best fighters ever seen. And so that kind of got around for a while, but they were likely no worse than any other invaders into Europe, like the Huns or the Magyars or anybody else. Um, it just, they happened to attack rich monasteries and churches along the coast, and so the terrified monks would kind of tell the tale of this horrible attack and probably embellish it. Um, as you can see, this Viking here has decided to run off with one of the church members' hats uh, and one of the women in the town or area around it as they're burning the monastery or town behind them. Um, and of course, this is pictures again told by the monks or pictured by the monks that would picture these. And was it like this? Maybe a little bit, but not necessarily, right? Um, other pictures of Vikings, which this is more modern, but this is what they probably looked like from what we can tell. Um, again, yes, helmets, but no horns on the side of their helmets. They used horns basically as what? Trumpets, basically, but that was typical of, you know, ancient and medieval periods anyway. They were raiders, definitely, and they attacked wherever, but they, and they kind of did the guerrilla style of tactics of fighting where they would attack somewhere and then leave. Because they're not going to sit around and wait for an enemy army to show up and kill them, right? That's just stupid. Um, especially when they've got their quick little boats to run away on. Um, but why did they raid from the Scandinavian areas? Well, they did so because of population growth in the Scandinavian areas. In those fjords, is there a lot of farmland? Again, go back to that slide. And anywhere to farm here? Not so much. Unless you're farming at the top of this cliff... Not a really good place to farm. 
And so why, what happens when your population starts increasing? You're going to need more food, right? Which means more land or more food brought from elsewhere. And so what ended up happening? People would go on raids and bring back food or supplies for their own small villages. And it would be the men going away for months at a time, coming back with months worth of food after staying away, you know, feeding themselves for months. And so also some of their leaders wanted more status, okay, to be able to trade with other ones and feel better about themselves with having cool jewelry from elsewhere. And so wealth was needed for this status and gift exchange. And this all started happening during the climatic warming period. The ice had been melting away out of these fjords, and now these people that were living there for decades beforehand or centuries beforehand are now able to actually start traveling around. Um, and beforehand, they weren't able to. This is also now that whole one degree of the... Um, third century being colder, it's kind of reversed. It's one degree warmer than any time before, or at least beforehand, and way warmer than during the third century. Crisis of the third century we talked about with the Romans. So things are actually becoming warmer, and so people are wanting to go and attack in different areas as well to get food and crops to bring back to Scandinavia to start maybe farming it. The raids ended up coming from Scandinavia, but they didn't just stop at Northern Europe and go up and down the rivers and hit England and Ireland and Scotland. They also hit elsewhere. In fact, they ended up traveling along the coasts all the way to the Strait of Gibraltar. And 62 Viking ships, all as one big fleet, actually sailed through the Strait of Gibraltar here between Spain and North Africa together and started attacking all sorts of places. They started attacking the North African coast, southern Spain, and even attacked Luna in northern Italy. However, they were unsuccessful when they did that. They attacked it and Luna was kind of, had good defenses and soldiers ready from previous attacks elsewhere. Um, and so the attack on Luna didn't work as well. However, these Vikings didn't stop there. They actually went as far as Alexandria in Egypt, way off map off this side, um, before finally deciding to turn back home um, after several successful raids along the coasts. When they started sailing back, the people that they attacked in Spain were known as the Moors. The Moors were these Muslim people living in Spain, okay, from the Arab Caliphates. They were one of the splinter groups from the Arab Caliphate that kind of was ruling in Spain, the Moors. And they had actually built a, a fleet because they had been attacked by the Vikings, and they're like, well, next time the Vikings come by, which could be, you know, at any time, we need to hunt them down and fight them. And so the Moors built their own fleet of ships, and so out of the 62 ships that originally went into the Mediterranean Sea, only 20 of them actually escape all the way back to to Scandinavia, because the Moors end up defeating 42 of them, right? As well as, you know, maybe in Luna, Alexandria, and elsewhere, got a few too. But um, the Moors defeated the majority of them. Now, many of them ended up going from Scandinavia to, uh, to Scotland area here, so let's talk a little bit about that, as well as also Ireland over here. And so as you can see here, Scandinavia here, and Denmark here, and Britain here, a lot of attacks ended up hitting Britain or England, as well as Scotland and Ireland. Several of these raids, from the 800s to 900s, or really 793 to 1066, but we'll talk about that later, that last date, um, but during the 800s to 900s, they started actually attacking places and then deciding, let's just stay. As opposed to constantly attacking, let's go back, pick up all our women and children from our settlement, and then move somewhere else. And eventually, the city of Dublin was actually found in Ireland, um, where it's actually, this is a picture of what Dublin would have looked like around the year 1000, of course, computer imaged. Um, but yeah, this is kind of what it would have looked like. It's now a giant large city in Ireland. Um, absolutely beautiful, by the way. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit, do so. Um, and over time, many of the people of these Vikings Kings or these Norse that have been raiding Britain, Scotland, and Ireland, as well as elsewhere, start actually intermarrying and marrying the um, uh, population and live peacefully with the populations of these areas, as well as elsewhere. Uh, we end up having raids in the 800s to 900s continuing elsewhere, such as now Francia, or the Francs, northern France, um, pictured here. Um, Paris is relatively inland, but... 
as you can actually see on this picture, Paris is right here. There's a river called the Loire River that goes all the way from Paris, actually further inland in France, all the way out to the coast. And so what ends up happening is the Vikings end up actually deciding to sail down that river, attacking along it, and the people of Paris decide, okay, well, let's get a bunch of money together as quickly as possible and pay the Vikings not to attack us. So the city of Paris is literally saved through bribery of the Vikings going, okay, thanks, that's good enough, let's go home. Um, finally, in 9-11, um, the French king, or the Franc king at the time, Charles the Simple, um, negotiates with one of the Viking leaders named Rollo, pictured here. Rollo is pictured here. Rollo actually eventually decides, after this negotiation to not attack the Francs anymore, um, decides to settle down in, in France, or, you know, what is nor modern day France, right? But this coastal area here. And when he does so, Rollo actually marries Charles the Simple, so the king's daughter, okay? And at that point, Rollo decides, okay, well, I might as well get baptized. At this time, several um, Vikings were becoming Christianized. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Rollo becomes renamed Robert after becoming baptized um, and takes he renames himself um, to a more Christianized version of Rollo um, named Robert. And so Rollo slash Robert, really Robert at this time, becomes the first Duke of Normandy, meaning the first leader or baron or well, Duke is the name of the title, of this area of France, this yellow area of Normandy. Normandy is a territory on, of, on the northern coast of France, and eventually Robert's great-great-grandson is named William, okay? Um, this great-great-grandson of William, um, who eventually also becomes Duke of Normandy, eventually becomes a man named William the Conqueror, and we're going to talk about him later in this lecture. Moving on. Now, not only did they attack to the west, right, where we've been showing beforehand with all these attacks this direction, they also started attacking this direction, off map. And so let's shift to a map there. Well, here's Norway and Sweden and Denmark, right, and Germany, France would be off map over here. And so did they only attack that direction? No, they actually also attacked these directions. Many of them ended up traveling along here, and um, they started moving from Swedish expansion in the 860s off this direction. The Vikings eventually become known as the Rus or the Varangians as they start moving further and further east. Okay, they just got different names. It was the Vikings according to the west, um, but on this case it is what? The Rus or the Varangians. Eventually, some of these Varangians via different, or Rus and Vikings, um, eventually travel via different rivers all the way down all of these different rivers throughout Russia, all the way to the Black Sea as well as the Caspian Sea here. Um, and in fact, even go further south than that, from the Black Sea into Constantinople in 838, they have reached Constantinople, and in fact, even go further south along the Tigris and Euphrates River, as well as over land, as well as a bunch of other places, all the way down to present-day Baghdad, which was in the Arab Caliphates, um, present-day Iraq today, right? Um, while in Constantinople, the Emperor of Constantinople, or the, East, or the Byzantine Empire, actually realizes having a bunch of very large northern Europeans that don't have loyalty to any of the royal families or noble families of the Byzantines is probably a good idea. And he actually employs the a group of Varangians, or Vikings, um, as a, a personal bodyguard of himself from then on, and several emperors would do that at one after another, and this number of Vikings being employed as basically a personal bodyguard of the emperor of the Byzantines becomes known as the Varangian Guard. The Varangian Guard. By the year 1040, or the 1040s, the Rus, living out now here, that decided Vikings that decided to stay in this area, have actually now intermarried with a lot of the people in this area, such as Slavs, other Scandinavians that have moved out this way as well, um, such as the Swedes first from here, Sweden, etc., and has moved over to Finland and then out into present-day Russia, and become known as the Rus. Um, and they are known for their, what, reddish hair, um, which the Vikings had, re relatively fair, right, blonde hair or red hair, okay? And so um, a lot of early Russian families had very fair 
fair hair, very blonde or red hair. Moving on. Over time, by about the 900s CE, we end up having a very slow spread of Christianity, not only into the Vikings that are settling down in places like Britain and, the, and Russia or the Rus, or even those that are settling in Ireland or Dublin or anywhere else like that in Scotland, but also kind of bringing Christianity back to the Scandinavian countries itself. Scandinavians are now being intermingled with Christians, and you have pagans and Christians intermingling. Eventually, um, first, at, originally, the Vikings made the sign of the cross. They would make the sign of the cross like the symbol of the cross with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know, that you may have seen in Christ movies whenever someone makes the cross across their, you know, from their head down to their chest and shoulders, right? That's the sign of the cross. They would do so because if they did that to a Christian that want, they wanted to talk to, the Christian would feel at ease, right? Oh, that person's also a Christian. We might not be able to communicate on a lot of things, other than maybe with some money and business, um, and we can't necessarily understand each other other than, like, you know, basically sign language or some kind of talking and, you know, gestures or whatever. But if all of a sudden that Viking does that sign of the cross, the person is put more at ease and is more willing to trade and do business with them right? because they're thinking, oh, well, that person's a Christian too. Well, uh, over time, some of these Vikings that started doing that actually converted to Christianity themselves for real. Um, and many Norse do actually convert to Christianity. Um, and as you can see, we end up having giant, beautiful churches, or not really giant, but very beautiful, tall churches in Scandinavia, in the fjords. This is one pictured even to a more recent period of time that has been rebuilt um, in the same style that they built back then. Absolutely gorgeous, right? Moving on, further Viking attacks into England. Well, over time, the Vikings kept on attacking England, as well as elsewhere, okay? By 878, the Vikings had conquered most of England, but not just England, but also other places. So, um, when the Anglo-Saxon king, Alfred the Great, which, who was king of the English, king of the English, Anglo-Saxons, okay, is victorious over the Vikings in a very large battle. Okay, in 878. They decided to sign a treaty, but they realized, or Alfred realized, that there were so many Vikings that he could sign a treaty and he could keep the Vikings out, but it wouldn't really last. Um, so he decides, okay, the Vikings can have the north of England and the English would be in the south and each set would rule separately. Okay, and so hopefully any Vikings that would attack, he'd basically say, hey, no, we have a treaty with you, you have to go to the north. Um, that didn't always work, because Vikings not being all from the same tribe would or group or settlement would end up attacking anyway, but it helped in some cases. Um, Vikings continued to still attack um, England until roughly the year 1000, um, because it's mostly Vikings that never signed the treaty or never even heard or cared about it. Now, the Vikings did also start exploring not only just eastwards or westwards to Europe, but also westwards across the Atlantic Ocean to Iceland, and actually settled Iceland in large numbers. Eventually, a man named um, Eric the Red, because of his reddish hair and reddish beard, um, was actually exiled from the island of Iceland and the settlements of Viking settlements there because he committed murder. He ended up killing someone, but he was a tribal leader, and as opposed to being kicked out, or sorry, killed, they decided, okay, let's just kick him out. So they exiled him, and that was in the year 980. He decided not to go on to, like, Ireland or Britain or Scotland or even back to Scandinavia. He decided to go westwards and find out what was this way. Well, he ended up going this way and reaching Greenland. Interestingly, Greenland is very, very icy, okay? If you know anything about Greenland, there's a lot of ice there. Iceland itself is very green. And both of them were named these re this because of certain reasons. One, Iceland was such a nice place, when the Vikings settled it, they didn't want a bunch of other Vikings showing up too. So they said, oh no, it's a terrible place, we call it Iceland. You know, you don't want to come here, it's just filled with ice. Um, it's in the name, guys. Just don't come here. Well, when Eric the Red settled in Greenland and started a small settlement in Greenland, or a colony in Greenland, he wanted more people to come there, and he knew that telling everybody, oh, it's filled with ice, isn't going to work, so he actually calls it Greenland, hoping that people will come and 
settle there um, because of it being a nicer place. Well, even though it wasn't. Around the year 1000, Leif Erikson, Eric the Red's son, hence the word Eric son, right, as his last name now, um, decides to leave Greenland from the colony that is there and start going up the coast and see what's up there, and then also out this direction in another trip. When he does this, he actually ends up stumbling upon North America, and he's actually the f he and his group of Vikings on his ships are actually the first Vikings ever to reach North America, Eric, Leif Erikson and his group of sailors or Vikings. Um, and so they call it Vinland. Vinland is the Viking name for North America, and that was roughly around the year 1000, so about 1021 years ago from today. Um, now in the year um, 1000, Leif Erikson decides, okay, I'm in North America, it's relatively nice, there's trees, there's, you know, not lots of ice in some places when he was there. He decides that he would stay there. He actually stays there for two winters, or about a total of three years, in what is modern-day northern Canada. And he's, he is the first group of Europeans ever in North America. Now, obviously, there were people in North America beforehand, what? The Native Americans, right? That had been there for several thousand years by this point, about 10,000 years, if not more. Um, Leif's brothers also sailed to North America, and Leif and his brothers basically keep on leaving North America because every single time they keep on trying to settle and make a town there or a colony there, hostile Native Americans end up driving them away. They're like, oh no, so you, you know, getting into fights with the Native Americans, they decide, okay, it's not worth it. Eventually, other Vikings end up settling this area um, in northern Canada, and settle a place called La Anse aux Meadow in Newfoundland, Canada. That is that little area here in Canada today. Um, and a big island area. Um, it's actually discovered later on, about 80 years ago from today, or sorry, 60 years ago from today, um, in the 1960s. Um, actually, our uh, historians actually accidentally discovered it. They were digging up for something else, and they ended up finding Viking remains and Viking um, artifacts, and they're like, oh wow, there's actually quite a lot here, and they found like an entire town of Vikings under the ground, or former town of Vikings, right? Um, now, the Vikings didn't just stay in Canada. They actually traveled further and further south into America as well, um, into North America, possibly as far south as North Carolina. However, whenever they got down here, they didn't really stay for long. Now, we do have artifacts of Viking... Um, uh, historical significance and historical time period in North Carolina and north of that, um, but not really far inland. They didn't really even go on the rivers or anything. Now, interestingly, um, a lot of people love to say the Vikings made it all the way to Minnesota, and that's not true at all. However, a few years ago, when I was in grad school, actually about a decade ago and now, um, my history professor and mentor actually told me a story about a student that he used to go to school with years and years beforehand, and that after both of them graduated, they kept in touch a little bit, and he found out what she ended up doing was absolutely crazy when she moved to Minnesota. And so I like to tell that story, and so I'll quickly tell it now. And what ends up happening is she is this historian in Minnesota, and she decides, okay, they wanted to give credibility to the Viking his, Viking football team name. And to do that, she was like, okay, well, maybe I could come up with some kind of crazy ploy to get some funding from the Viking football team, even though there's no such thing as Vikings living out here. What if I could trick people into thinking there was? And so what she ends up doing one night is getting drunk, drunk and carving into a stone a bunch of runes pictured here. Not this exact stone, but very similar to these runic alphabets of the Vikings. And so she ends up basically telling this um, story about how the Vikings made it through rivers and through the Great Lakes all the way to Minnesota and to um, out there. And she figures, okay, at some point the farmer in this area is going to dig up this land um, in this field and find this stone, and they're going to go, oh my gosh, this is Viking writing, and they're going to call her as being the top Viking historian in the area, and th that would get her a bunch of publicity with the Viking football team. Um, however, the problem is, is yes, it was all found, and plan is working out for her, however, people can do 
studies on stones and other things today to find out how old things are, and then found out that the carvings in the stone didn't match the time period that they should have been carved, right? And so, obviously, she was found to be a fraud, and this drunken plan of her to get a bunch of money from the Vikings football team um, and publicity from that really didn't work out. So did the Vikings ever make it to Minnesota in real life? No. The football team is just out there for because it's a cool name. Um, but no, North Carolina is as far south as the Vikings ever got um, in North America. So Canada and North Carolina and along the coast, like New York, New Jersey, etc. areas. But sporadic areas. Moving on. Westward in expansion, the sagas and the runes. Now, how do we know about some of these stories of the Vikings? Well, it's because of oral histories originally, and then eventually over time, the oral histories were written down in their version of the runic alphabet, or an alphabet called the runic alphabet. It was a written alphabet, and it was used to record some of the sagas, telling, telling the deeds of specific Viking leaders, or each of these sagas, okay? A story or saga about a specific leader. They were carved into stone rather than written in ink, and they were carved not only just in stone, as pictured here, but also in bone, wood, and metal, okay? And so really, Anything hard that they could just carve something into, they would carve, and they had an alphabet, and you could kind of hear this story as you traveled around it, or this would be like a sentence of this story of this person. We have the Greenland Saga, written around 1200 CE, um, which was talking about the accidental discovery of the new land known as Vinland, um, which tells of it happening 200 years prior under Leif Erikson, which is why we have a good history of him doing it, and it talks about him finding Vinland and then staying there for a couple winters. Then we also have Eric's Saga, which is written a few years later, 1210 to 1310, somewhere in between about that period of time, and it talks about Leif discovering Vinland again and spending three years there. And it's all about these different sagas of Eric the Red and Leif Erikson, his son, discovering different places. But there are also other ones talking about other ones um, uh, in Europe as well happening. Moving on. In 1066, we end up having the attacks on the Vikings, um, or the attacks by the Vikings onto England, kind of stop. And why does that happen? Well, it's an interesting story. In January of 1066, the English king, Edward I, king of England, the red part, dies. His successor happens to be a man named Harold II, and Harold II becomes King of England after Edward's death. Well, William of Normandy, that great-great-grandson of Rollo, okay, of Normandy, okay, who used to be a Viking, had actually saved young Harold from drowning several years earlier. And when Har uh, William saved Harold from drowning in the English Channel one day, um, by seeing him, you know, when they were sailing around, they're like, oh, what's that? Oh, it's a person almost drowning in the English Channel. Let's pull him out and make sure he doesn't die. Well, Harold II swore that if he ever were to become king, he would just give that territory to William. Okay? Whatever he became king of, he would just give to William. Now, Harold probably did so thinking, oh, well, William's never going to come to collect, and if he does, well, I'll just be able to defeat him. Or two, I'm never going to become king, because Edward's not just going to just drop dead one day. Okay? Well, regardless, William's still alive when Harold becomes king, and decides, Harold, you better, better listen to that deal that you made years ago. Well, Harold says no, not going to happen. So William of Normandy begins to build a fleet of ships in Normandy, a bunch of Viking ships as well as other ships, to start invading across the English Channel, and does so in 1066. Well, at the same time as William of Normandy is preparing a fleet of ships to sail across the English Channel, a Viking fleet comes from Scandinavia and attacks England, um, and that Viking army attacking England um, near the city of York... Um, Harold decides, oh, I've got to go fight them. So Harold ends up going up to the city of York with his army, and they get into a fight against the Viking army and Harold's English army. And at, this battle is at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Harold II wins this battle and defeats the Vikings. And on September of 1066, William of Normandy's fleet and army is finally ready in France and sails to the south of England. Roughly the same month, the same exact month that... Harold just defeated a Viking army, 
another army is coming. Harold's army in the north of England has to march all the way from the north of England all the way to the south to fight against this William of Normandy fleet that has come now too. And so Harold's army has just fought one battle and is really tired and has a bunch of dead people and injured people from this, but now has to fight another army. And so here we have at the Battle of Hastings in October of 1066, where William the Conqueror's army, or, um, or William of, the, of Normandy, is fighting against Harold II. And during this battle of the Battle of Hastings, Harold II is shot in the eye by an arrow, pictured here, um, or pictured here on this tapestry, which is also known as the Bayeux Tapestry, which we will talk about in just a minute. And William of Normandy's army then defeats the rest of Harold's army, even though Harold's dead. It doesn't matter for him. The rest of his army is defeated. And so William of Normandy is now not just William of the area of Normandy in northern France, but William I of England. Okay? And also becomes known as William the Conqueror because he what? Conquered England. He, William, is a descendant of Rollo, a.k.a. Robert, the first Normandy duke of Normandy, is now the king of England, meaning that England, okay, is now ruled by a descendant of the Vikings, okay? Um, interestingly, the Viking attacks on England coincidentally stops around this period of time. Most of the Vikings had just kind of tapped out from wanting to attack places, and now we're in the idea of colonizing and settling places peacefully. Um, that last army that attacked at the Battle of Stamford Bridge was really the last time the Vikings really attacked anywhere in a large number. While William of Normandy, or William I, is King of England, he decides to have a new book published of a census of England. It is called the Domesday Book, or Doomsday Book is how it's pronounced, but it's Domesday. Um, it is a written record of all of the people and land in the area of England, okay? Um, and then we do have the Bayou Tapestry produced, um, during this period of time, which is absolutely gorgeous. This is what it looks like if you were to stretch it out all the way, um, or long, um, it's basically a big giant comic book. And this is what it looks like in person. This is a person next to it. I've actually seen it, and it's this, it's in this museum in France, which is this giant long hallway. The entire museum is basically one big hallway with this big giant cloth tapestry with sewn on scenes like a comic book, pictured all like these pictures, including Harold getting shot in the eye here, as and boats going across the English Channel and stuff, um, with these basically 32 to 50 scenes from the years 1064 to 1066, which talks about William of Normandy's invasion of uh, Britain, or England, as well as Halley's Comet flying overhead during this period of time. Yes, the same comet that comes around every 80 years. It was around back then in the sky. Um, Battle of Hastings, which is the battle where William defeats Harold, and then William I being crowned as King of England. And it's this basically comic book. Um, it's 231 feet long and 20 inches high, if you look at how big it is, and it weighs a total of 770 pounds because it's one big giant piece of cloth um, all sewn together. It has 623 different people stitched on it, some of them replicas like Harold doing one thing or William doing a thing, and then William doing another thing, etc. It has 202 horses, 55 dogs, 506 other birds and animals, including like a unicorn and I think a couple other non-living creatures, um, like mythical ones. 49 trees, 41 ships, 37 buildings, and 57 Latin inscriptions containing almost 2,000 letters. That's a lot of sewing got done on this absolutely gorgeous tapestry. Okay, moving on. We will cover feudalism. Actually, I said I was going to cover it this time in class, but let's take a break today, and we'll just cover it on Tuesday in class in person. Have a great weekend. Also, in addition to feudalism next time, I'll also cover the agricultural revolution, which is making farming good in Europe, which is extremely important, and I'll explain that in a kind of fun way. I think you'll enjoy some of the stories I tell with that. We're also going to talk a lot about the Catholic Church and a bunch of scandals and changes in the Catholic Church. We'll talk about the Crusades, where a bunch of people from all over Europe ended up attacking the Middle East um, over somewhat of a religious reason, but it really wasn't that originally. Um, and then we're also going to 
to talk about the first attempt at democracy in Europe, called the Magna Carta. Well, first attempt of democracy since, basically, Rome fell, right? And so we'll talk about all of that next time on Tuesday, in addition to the feudalism lecture that I was planning on doing today, but this is a long enough lecture. So have a great weekend, like I said.